Thank you, Ansu, for praying. We we'll come to the thirteenth uh, verse of uh, we we'll complete the thirteenth verse of Hebrews chapter four, uh, where it's written, "Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight; everything uncovered and laid bare for the eyes of Him, to whom we have to give an account." So, in, in life, nothing is hidden from God. We spoke about that uh, on on uh, the previous session on Wednesday. We're going to go on from verse fourteen. Verse fourteen begins with "therefore." Therefore, whenever we read the word "therefore," we are look at the previous context, previous verse. It talks about how God knows everything about us. We cannot hide from God. He's given us His word, and the previous word, uh, previous verse, twelfth verse says, "Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It divides soul and spirit." So, word of God penetrates our very heart. And reveals our hearts to us, so we can't hide from God. Everything is known to God, so face up to God, and simply accept His word. And as we accept His word by faith, we're going to be so much blessed. Then the writer goes on to talk about the high priest. Therefore, since we are great high priest for the house of God, let's let me read that verse, fourteenth verse. Therefore, since we have a great high priest. Was ascended into heaven, Jesus, Son of God. Let us home. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We have a great high priest who ascended into the heavens. Let me spend some time on the word priest. The greatest high priest is Christ. But before that, we talk about the priesthood in the Old Testament time. In the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter ten, eight and nine, we read. At that time, that is before they enter the land of Canaan, the book of Deuteronomy, God set apart the tribe of Levi to be priests, and they had three basic functions: to carry the ark of the covenant, which contained the tablets of stone, the law, ten commandments, manna, a sample of manna. And Aaron's rod that budded, and the ark of the covenant signifies the presence of God. The Levites were chosen, set apart, set apart to be holy. Number one, to carry the ark of the covenant. Number two, to minister before the Lord on behalf of the people. That's the role of the priest to intercede. On behalf of people to God, they were required to minister before the Lord. That's number two, and number three, to pronounce blessings on the people. Pronounce blessings. So interceding is on behalf of people to God, and blessings are on behalf of God to people, and carry the ark of the covenant. And then that two verses it says, therefore. They were required not to be given any land, the land of Canaan. God will be their inheritance. You are to give them no possession in the land. God says, "I will be their inheritance." Before they enter the land of Canaan, God told through Moses, "These are my people, my Levites, my priests, descendants of Levi, and subsequently descendants of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses. No land for them." No physical land. I will be their inheritance. I will be their possession. They are required to carry the ark of the covenant, to minister before the Lord, and pronounce blessings for the people. That was the function. Later on, they were required to offer sacrifices. Sacrifices on behalf of people to God for the payment of sins. In fact, the temple in Jerusalem. Once in a year, the high priest would enter the most holy place. Once in a year, after sacrificing for his own sins and for the sins of the people, would come to the temple. There was a Jewish court, Gentile court, also a lepers. Only the high priest would enter the most holy place behind the curtain, and only after offering sacrifice. For his own sins, 
and for the sins of the people outside. So priests were people who offered sacrifices. They would enter the most holy place. That is the Old Testament priesthood and altar. Also, we find till Christ came and they offered sacrifices, this is how it was done. Now, look at this particular verse. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heavens, not just behind the curtain, not just behind the holy place, ascended in beyond the heavens. The word heavens here is a word called Uranus. Uranus means the sky, the heavens. For example, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 19 verse 1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth proclaimed the work of his hands. The heavens declare the glory of God. Look up the heavens, the stars, the Milky Ways. And the Lord went beyond the heavens into the place of paradise. The God resides. Now, if you look in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 57 verse 15, we read, God lives in a high and a holy place, but also with him who is contrite at heart. He lives in a high and a holy place. Also with him who is contrite in heart. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, unlike the earthly priest who went to the most holy place behind the curtain with the blood of animals for their own sins, and for sins of the people outside, they enter the holy place. But where Jesus went, beyond the heavens, to heaven itself, paradise. The word paradise is mentioned at least three times in the Bible. Luke 23, 43. When the thief on the cross told Jesus, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. He doesn't say, I want to come to heaven. I want to be with you in heaven. He doesn't say that. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. Remember there was a, ma a man next to you on the cross, thief. Remember me. Look what Jesus says. Verily, verily, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. I am telling you today, you will be with me in paradise. That day, Jesus did not go to paradise. Because even the third day when he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he says, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. He told the, the thief on the cross, I'm telling you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise song in Greek, paradise song. One more verse where paradise is used is 2 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 4. Verse 2, Paul talks about, I know a man caught him the third heaven, third heaven. And the fourth verse, he explains about paradise. The third heaven refers to paradise, paradise song in Greek. A third place where it's used is the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 7, where the Lord says that those who overcome, he'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life is now in the paradise of God. Remember the tree of life in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, when man sinned against God, God put a hedge around the tree of life so that man would not eat of the tree in a sinful state. If he ate from the tree in a sinful state, he would live forever for eternal life in a sinful state. God put protection around the tree of life. And only a mankind, after mankind is redeemed, he ate from the tree of life. And this tree of life is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2.7 so the Lord Jesus Christ is in paradise. One day we'll be with him in paradise. So he entered the heavens itself, not just beyond the curtain in the temple in Jerusalem. The priest, the earthly priest went beyond the curtain into the holy place. Whereas this great high priest entered heaven itself. What an amazing ministry he has got. Again, going back to the priesthood of the Old Testament time, they carry the Ark of the Covenant, whereas Christ himself is the Word of God. He is Word become flesh. He himself is the Word of God. Revelation 19.13, he is the Word of God. 
and also he ministers before God and says, of course, he ministers before the Father in heaven. Today, he's at God's right hand, interceding for our sins. Interceding for our sins. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, Dear brothers, write this too that he will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we are one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. Today, the Lord Jesus Christ has gone into the heavens, beyond the skies, in a high and holy place mentioned in Isaiah 57, 15, which I believe is the paradise of God. And is interesting on behalf of us before the Father in heaven. Whenever we sin against God today, the devil accuses us before the Father in heaven. He is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12, 10 says, the accuser of the brethren accuses them before God day and night. 11th verse says, they overcame him, they meaning the, the uh, believers, brethren, overcame him, meaning the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. As we testify to what the blood has done for us on the cross, we overcome the evil one. There is therefore no accusation for, all, for us. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those in, Je those in Jesus Christ who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. So we are a great high priest who has gone beyond the heavens, not be just beyond the curtain. He is word of God himself and he's interceding for us and he blesses us today. John 1.16, from the fullness of his grace we receive blessing after blessing. So he's a perfect high priest. The great high priest, far above the priesthood of man. Please remember the first three, four chapters of Hebrews about how the writers exhorting the Jewish Christians to realize who they have come to believe in. This Jesus Christ, our Lord, is far above the prophets, far above the angels, far above Moses, and far above the priests. He's a perfect great high priest. Also, in those days, those priests used to offer for the sins sacrifice and enter the holy place after making sacrifice. This great high priest, not only the priest, he is a sacrifice himself. The priest and the sacrifice are basically the same. What an amazing truth that is. The song in Hindi we sing, Tuhi Data Tuhi Daan. Tuhi Data, you are the one who gives the sacrifice and you are the sacrifice, Tuhi Daan. He is both the sacrifice and the sacrificer. He gave himself after living a sinless life. Therefore, we have confidence before him. Look at the next verse. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. This great high priest has gone through all we have gone through, we go through in life. Please don't think the only temptations he went through were the temptations mentioned in the fourth chapter of Matthew or the fourth chapter of Luke. But the evil one tempted him three times. But then it also says after he tempted him, it could not succeed in tempting him. He left him until an opportune time. He left Jesus until an opportune time. He thought some other time will come when he succeed in tempting Jesus. But he could not. Absolutely could not. 
Now, when you say the word tempted, we use the word tempted, we don't know. For example, supposing if I tell you, I went to a drinking party and I got tempted. I just stop at that. I went to a drinking party and I got tempted. You are thinking, okay, did he drink or did he not drink? Did he have whiskey or didn't have whiskey? Because the word tempted doesn't really say whether you act a real temptation or a sister temptation. I got tempted. You don't know what really happened. So what tempted is a very misleading word. In the case of Jesus, temptations were shown to him. They were shown to him, but he did not yield to temptation. Because 1 John 3, 5 says, in him there was no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to become sin for us, to become sin offering for us. That in him we may become the righteousness of God. Now when it says he was tempted in every way, it means that temptation was shown to him. Exposed. He was exposed to temptation, but he did not sin. So unlike in our case, when you say I got tempted. You do not whether I shall yield temptation or not. In the case of Jesus, not once he yielded to temptation. After 40, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, the evil one told him in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, if you are the son of God, tell the stones to become bread. And he was hungry. He had the power to make stones to bread. He made everything in this universe. By him, all things were created. You could have made bread into, uh, sown into bread. Temptation to satisfy the hunger. What did he say? It's written. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Meaning, right now, the rhema of the Father in heaven for me is for me to fast 40 days and 40 nights. So I have to obey his word. It's written. Live by every word that comes from Father. So I can make this bread to uh, shown to become bread. I can do that. I won't do that. Because I'm supposed to live by every word. The Father's will for me is to fast 40 days and 40 nights. So he was hungry. See, Jesus had a body like any one of us. In him there was no sin. He had a body like any one of us. He could feel tired. John chapter 4, verse 6, he could feel thirsty. John chapter uh, 19, verse 38, he could feel thirsty. He could feel tired, could feel hungry. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. And therefore, he faced temptation, but did not yield to temptation. That's why it says in Hebrews 2, 18, Hebrews 2, 18, because he himself suffered while being tempted, he's able to help those being tempted. We have a high priest who's not, who's not unable to sympathize with the weakness when he's tempted every way, yet was without sin. Any temptation resisted. Look at the next verse, 16th verse. How beautiful this is. I'll spend some time on this. Let us then approach. God's throne of grace with confidence. The word confidence is uh, parasan in Greek. Parasan it basically means boldness. Let's put the throne of grace with boldness. Confidence, boldness. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Because we are high priest who also was shown temptations like we are shown temptation. Every temptation we face today, he was exposed to, but not once he yielded to temptation. In him there was no sin. So he knows how we feel when we are exposed to temptations. The possibility of eating something when you're very hungry and it's available for you. So in our case, uh, we don't make stones to become bread. <laughs> but when you're hungry and you God wants you to fast, there's food in front of you before your very eyes. You can attempt to eat it. No? Don't have to make stones to become bread. But this food is there. But because God said, 
don't, don't eat now, I have wanted you to fast, then you, you obey God. So all of us face temptations, but with the strength of God, we can face temptations. So because he's been through all that, he's able to help us to approach him with boldness and confidence that we receive mercy and grace to help us in a time of need. Very often I share with you that God is the God of grace, God of mercy. Mercy and grace are slightly different. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve. We do something wrong, we deserve punishment. But God doesn't punish us because he's a merciful God. He does not punish us. He refrains from giving punishment. That's the expression of God's mercy. What is grace? Grace is receiving something we don't deserve. We don't deserve God's blessings, but he blesses us. That's the grace of God. So when you face temptations, you can go boldly before Jesus and say, Lord, you went through all I'm going through now, Lord. You resist temptation, Lord. And help me, Lord, resist temptation. You understand me, Lord. And let me tell you, no one understands you more than the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked this earth like you and me. Every temptation we face today, he faced. He was successful in resisting temptation. And he's a helper. He's not a spectator when you face temptations. He's a helper. And he's so faithful, he will not allow us to be tempted more than he can bear. First Corinthians 10.13 says, God is faithful. He will not allow to be tempted or tested. The word is pyrasmos in Greek. Tempted or tested. More than you can bear. With every temptation, there's a way out like a standard perfect. So as we face temptation, we go to God boldly, confidently. Lord, you went through all I'm going through, Lord. So at this point of time, your word says, Lord, you're a faithful God. You won't allow me to be tempted more than I can bear. So right now, Lord, I need your mercy and grace. Mercy. In case I need temptation, be merciful, Lord. Don't punish me, Lord. And God won't punish. He's merciful. And as opposed to that, I say, Lord, give me grace for, for me to face temptation, which means I want strength to face temptation. In Ephesians 3 7, Paul writes, Ephesians 3 7, I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me by the working of his power. This power of God is given by the grace of God. We can't demand that power. We receive that power. And God loves to strengthen us. Old Testament time, Second Chronicles 16.9, written, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to the Lord. God is actually examining our hearts. He sees their hearts. At the time of temptation, he sees the hearts. Does my child really want to resist temptation? Is he committed to me? And God is searching for people whom he wants to strengthen. He strengthens those whose hearts are committed. So at the point of temptation, ask God to show your heart. Something wrong in the heart, set it right. So, Lord, give me a heart for you, Lord. I want a heart that seeks your heart. Like David, a man after God's own heart. And the Lord also explained uh, through the scriptures in the book of Acts 13.22. What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? Acts 13.22 is written, God testifies about David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, he will do everything I want him to do. So preparing a heart to be fully committed to him, a heart after God's own heart means 
being prepared to do whatever God wants us to do. A heart fully committed. Lord, I will do your will. With that kind of heart we have got, we will have the strength to face temptation. He will strengthen us by his grace. Mercy is not getting punishment for the wrong things we do. Grace is getting strength to do the things we have to do. We don't deserve the strength. He gives us strength. So he gives us both grace and strength, grace and mercy. We have confidence of boldness to enter the most holy place. Praise God for the amazing grace he's given us. So whenever temptation comes, remember, it's because you have the strength to face it, it's come to you. Please never think you're alone in that temptation. He is on your side. He is for you. Romans 8.31 If God be for us, who can be against us? He is not a spectator watching us. Spectator watching us when we face temptation. Well, let me see what you do. You promise to obey me. Temptation has come to you. Let me see what you do. He is actively involved in strengthening us and together with the strength we can face every temptation of the evil one. And by the way, the Lord lives in us. How often I told you that? He lives in us. So let him have full control in our lives. Let him live his life through us. And as you depend totally on the Lord, no longer I but Christ. Look at the way the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in Christ, live in the world, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. Faith in him means putting an entire trust in him and letting him have full control of our lives. After all that, if we still fail to obey God, thank him for his blood that cleanses us. Ultimately, our hope is not our holiness. It's not our capacity to resist temptation. For his grace to forgive us when we, when, we get sin, when we sin against God. And our hope is always on the blood of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Peter writes, We are chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. We're all called to obey every teaching of Jesus. That happens by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Spirit sanctifies us. And the calling of God the Father, he foreknew us, those that foreknew, he called us to follow Jesus, chose us to follow Jesus. And for some reason, if you fail to follow him, where the blood of Christ cleansing us. Ultimately, our hope is his grace, his blood. And because we have grace and blood, and the amazing resource is given us, the word that sanctifies us, John 17, 17, spirit sanctifies us, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, we obey joyfully by faith, Romans 1, 17, after all that, if we fail to obey God, we have the blood cleansing us. So we have a confidence to enter the most holy place and thank him for grace and mercy will give us at the time of need. And time of need in this context is facing temptations. May God bless us and give us victory in every area of our lives. Where the great high priest has gone to the heavens, is on our side, he lives in us, he'll guide us, he'll help us, and he will not let us alone. Never leave us, never forsake us. May God bless us as we take Christian life very seriously and walk intimately and closely. God bless you all.